Foundation, now under consideration in the Senate, plus Stephen Schwartz with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He'll talk about terrorist groups in Israel and the occupied territories and who funds them. Washington Journal starts at 7 a.m. Eastern. Later in the day, FBI Director Robert Mueller will give a luncheon speech at the National Press Club. We'll have live coverage starting at 1 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. Now more of today's hearing on the FBI's use of informants in the case of Boston organized crime figure James Whitey Bulger. The House Government Reform Committee will continue to hear testimony from Mr. Bulger's brother, University of Massachusetts President William Bulger. This final portion is just over two hours. Committee will return to order. Um, before I uh, refer questions over to Mr. LaTourette, I just I have one issue that I wanted to get to the bottom of. We'd asked earlier about the special legislation uh, that was put in the budget amendments in uh, 1981, just following the Lancaster Street garage uh, bugging incident. Uh, this was legislation that, at least as I read it, was aimed at about five officers, two of whom were involved in <coughs> the um, bugging of uh, Whitey Bulger in the Lancaster Street garage, uh, that some uh, in the press and, and have uh, dubbed retaliatory. I'm just trying to understand in my mind, other than singling out five officers who would have to retire early or lose uh, other benefits, how this could have happened or what other public policy issue might have been at stake here. And I just wonder, uh, Mr. Bulger, if either you or your counsel, Mr. Kiley, could shed any light on that. I'd like to, Mr. Kiley, if you'd like to, I know you were at the can I swear you in for on this just to Absolutely. Sally swear the testimony about to give you the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth? I certainly do. Okay. I say this because I understand you were at, around the State House at the time and at least were acquainted with the issues. I was would, would you turn on your mic, please? Uh, if I can figure it out. That's it. There you go. Um, I was in 1981, as I had been for the prior six years, the first Assistant Attorney General for the Commonwealth. I served in that position for 10 years. Okay. Um, we had a state police um, contingent in the office, uh, which uh, at one point, and I believe it included in 1982, was headed by Captain, uh, later Lieutenant Colonel Agnes, one of the gentlemen who provided you an affidavit. Uh, in the affidavit and in the President's testimony, there is an allusion to a, a reference to a controversy that existed in Massachusetts following the United States Supreme Court's decision in United States versus Murgia, M-U-R-G-I-A. It related to the retirement ages in the uniform branch and the detective lieutenants. The uniform branch people were required to retire at a very early age. The detective lieutenants and these five individuals were among them were not. They had civil service status. They retired at 65. The controversy that existed for years um, was whether it was fair to the uniformed branch people to leave the senior staff on top of them so that there were not opportunities for promotion. There was the issue. And if I may uh, uh, refer you again to the affidavit of Peter Agnes, he alludes to that problem. I also want to suggest, uh, and I think it's an important point to the committee, that we have provided you news clips contemporaneous from 1981, uh, in addition to these clips, uh, and uh, to Congressman Meehan's point, um, uh, one of those articles suggests that the, uh, the um, outside section actually emanated from the House uh, and was in the House budget. We've not been able, I've not been able to nail that down with uh, historic research. But this amendment, the outside section that you are talking to, has an unclear provenance. It may have originated in the House, not the Senate. And it's certainly, there were certainly other <coughs> issues on the table at the time. 
One other quick point. Um, the Lancaster Street Garage surveillance, by all accounts, was conducted by, largely by, uniformed branch personnel. The uniformed branch personnel would have benefited, not been harmed, by the passage of the rider. Um, now that, again, as I've, I've told you, staff, that's argument, not, that last point is argument, right. not fact. All right, well, I'm just trying to put it all together. Of course, we're going to go back and check the legislative record to the extent that we can uh, 20 years later, but that at least, uh, from, from my perspective, clears up what, at least what might have happened. And again, it's, it's referenced in those Agnes and Nally affidavits that you have. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very Chairman. much. Uh, yes, so just so we're clear on this issue, so, uh, Mr. Kiley, you're saying that it, this wasn't an, it wasn't an outside section of the, uh, that was included in the Ways and Means proposal. Uh, Senate Ways and Means. Yeah, Congressman, I have gone back and done the research in the journal and so forth, and I have not been able to nail it down. I can't tell you where it came from, and I've been trying to do that with, uh, with committee staff. So you can't say it is or it isn't? I can't. Okay. Great. All Thanks. right. Thank you. Under unanimous consent, each side will now be given 30 minutes. Uh, we'll proceed with uh, Mr. La Tourette. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Bulger, it's nice to see you again. The um, affidavits that uh, sort of sporadically have been put into the record during the course of the, the day, I, I have received them last night, and it looks like they were faxed down from Mr. Kiley's office um, yesterday morning, maybe about 10 o'clock. Uh, and uh, while I appreciate them, the difficulties that I have with, with affidavits like this is you can't ask them questions. I mean, they are, they are what they are. And I, I might ask the Chairman that since these folks have been kind enough to want to participate in our hearing, maybe we should chat with them just a, a little bit later if there are questions on the affidavits. And, and I just want to ask you, uh, I assume that they came into existence because you and or your lawyer reached out to these people. They didn't know we were coming today and said, hey, I got something I want to say, that you reached out to them. Is that Yes, my uh, counsel has done so. Okay. And, and I want to return to the 1995 phone conversation between you and your brother that took place at, uh, at an employee's home. Uh, and again, it was set up by Kevin Weeks, wanted to know where you were and the phone mm -hmm. call was made. You, in your uh, opening remarks, you referred to it as a short conversation, I think, three or four times. And then in response, I think, to, to Mr. Waxman's question, you indicated it was about a three or four minute conversation. Uh, when asked what the substance of the conversation was, I, uh, just to, to summarize what I heard you say, he said, you know, don't believe everything you hear and uh, tell everybody things are going to be okay. And you expressed the the concern on behalf of your family that, that you all care about what happens to him. That, that, that only takes about 30 seconds. Even I've, I've learned that folks in the south of New England speak slower than we do in Ohio, but uh, that, that's only 30 seconds. So right. is it, what, was it a 30-second a phone call, or, or was there more that, that you're not remembering today, uh, or were there variations on that theme about expressions of concern back and forth that then consumed another two and a half, three and a half minutes? Uh, well, Congressman, I don't have a distinct uh, recollection of the minute-by-minute uh, minute, uh, conversation. I don't have that. But that's the idea that I came away with, that uh, everything uh, is not as it seems, and that I'm, doing, I'm okay. And in turn, I told him, you know, we care about you. Right. And we uh, want you to, I hope it's going to have a happy ending. Right. And I, I think what I've probably provided you with is not so much the, uh, the words, but the gist of the conversation. The gist conversation. of the conversation. During the course of the conversation, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you did not advise your brother to turn himself in during that phone conversation. That's correct. Uh, and likewise, he did not reveal to you where he was. That's true. Now, there's been some discussion about the leaking of, of grand jury uh, evidence, and I find that uh, as abhorrent as my colleagues from Massachusetts do. But uh, one of the, the newspapers uh, is quoted as saying that allegedly was in receipt of those documents that indicate that, in fact, in, when you were in front of the grand jury, you testified uh, that you told him not to turn himself in. Oh, that's that, not true. That's not an accurate I statement. mean, if they reported, I believe the Globe may have reported that. Is that, that's the, but it's, but it's absolutely not so that I told, I, did, I never said such a thing to him. Prior to your appearance at the grand jury, or maybe during the course of your appearance at the grand jury, did, did you request uh, immunity from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts before making that appearance? Did I request immunity from the Commonwealth? 
before your grand jury testimony? Uh, we, no, we never had no occasion to do that, no, sir. Okay. I, also, as I, I asked you a couple of weeks ago, I, I think uh, I don't have the, the same strong feelings that maybe Mr. Shays expressed, but I, I think that um, when you invoked the Fifth Amendment privilege on December the 6th up in Boston, that caught some of us by surprise. I've heard you explain today and, and the other day that you were afraid that it was going to be some sort of memory test. And I also understand that the idea of immunity uh, was one that, that was generated by the committee. It wasn't you and your counsel calling up and saying, I'm only going to come see you if you mm -hmm. give us immunity. But I, I guess the question that I have is, between the date that you invoked the Fifth Amendment when the committee was in Boston, uh, and then uh, I, I would assume that uh, there would come a time, I would think, when you would say, I, I don't have anything to fear here. Uh, and, and I think, as I expressed to you a couple of weeks ago, as I listened to you a couple of weeks ago and I listened to you today, I'm not, and I'm not conversant with Massachusetts mm -hmm. law, and if you say that there's a, you and your lawyer say there's a section where you can talk to your brother or your sister and you don't get in trouble for that, even if they happen to be uh, killers, uh, I, I'll take that on face value. But, but, but I'm wondering, what, you, there's nothing that you've said today that, that you've done anything wrong. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why uh, there didn't come a time after you took the 5th in, in December and then finally the negotiations are for you to show up here that, that you didn't reach that conclusion as well. Well, I, I became increasingly comfortable after the conversations. I, I do know that. But I thought the die had been cast back in December by my um, invocation of my constitutional right. And at that time in uh, December, I can just tell you that um, I was very much concerned about the fact that just a, upon the arrival of the committee in Boston, uh, the, the government had released or leaked my grand jury minutes to the Boston Globe. And I feared that other people might have it. And therefore, I would be at this huge disadvantage, in my view, where I would be uh, required to remember exactly what I had said two years before. And they would have all the advantage of being able to look at my notes. And, and that was a matter of large concern to me. Sure. Well, that's a commonly used trick that prosecutors do to take former testimony and try and trip you up. And I, I, I certainly understand that. Let, let me ask you, when you received the subpoena in, in December to appear in December, did, did you hire a, a public relations firm to, to help you, aside from legal counsel, did you hire a public relations firm to deal with the subpoena and, and your appearance before the committee? I, I hired counsel, and we had people who, who uh, do uh, public relations work who were being helpful to us, yes, and I did pay them myself. And, and uh, was the, the purpose of that to, to somehow get out your side, aside from the appearance, but was it also to help with the media in, in terms right. of spinning whatever it is you wanted the Boston yeah, media was, to believe about this? That's exactly right. I was trying to get some uh, part of my point of view into the public domain. Uh, following uh, that retention and, and around the time of your testimony, there were also some not so pleasant stories about our former chairman, who I see now is in the chair today. What, was there any strategy discussed that uh, it's not an uncommon technique in, in politics to, to not only defend but to attack? Was there any suggestion of, by, of that? I, ne I never heard of it, Congressman. If there were any ad hominems, they didn't come at my suggestion. Okay. And, and certainly from that answer, that isn't a tactic that you would approve of, certainly, by some no, think No, I should. Okay. I've been careful myself. I, wa I want to uh, now just turn to quickly to the, the wire, to the pen registers for just a second. As I understand, Kevin Weeks, who has recently testified in the Verizon case, has indicated that uh, that information was given to him by Mr. Schneiderman. Uh, and he testified that he gave that to your brother, Jackie. Do you, do you know that to be true, other than... I just said it, and Kevin Weeks testified under oath to that fact. No, no I, do, I don't know that it's so. Okay. And, and, and again, your, your uh, story is that uh, no one in law enforcement or no one outside of law enforcement ever indicated to you that there were pen registers on your phone, and that knowledge only came to you when, pursuant to statute, your lawyer was notified that you had been the subject of electronic surveillance. That's right. It was back in 1998. And by the way, Jack would have heard the same thing to his lawyer. So the two of us were well aware of it. Well, well but I, I, I think that the allegation is that the tip came before the, the notification. It's after? You think it's Subsequent. after? The, um, if I may, Congressman, sure. oh, sure. our correspondence is dated October 9, 1998. 
the allegation with respect to Trooper Schneiderhan is that the tip came in 1999, a year later. Okay. Well, thank you for clearing that up. The last, the last area, with the Chair's indulgence, that I, I want to talk a little bit about the safe deposit boxes. Uh, apparently, your, your brother has safe deposit did or may still have safe deposit boxes around the world, and one of them was in the United Kingdom. Uh, today, you're aware of that fact. Is that right? Yes. And you're also aware of the fact that you were a contact name on at least one box right. today. And, and how did you come into possession of that information? Through the newspaper. It was reported in the newspaper, and that was the very first I ever heard of it. I, I had thought, and, and I'm not trying to do anything tricky, I had thought when we talked a couple of weeks ago that they had, in fact, that one of the banking institutions had called your home. That's what I understand, too. They claim to have done so. But, but in checking with your family members, no nobody one remembers um, receiving a telephone call from the bank about a safe call deposit. such a call. No. I, I would yield back. I don't have anything else at this time. Mr. Shays. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Bolger, for being here. I, um, I have a different view of the Fifth Amendment than yours, um, and maybe they're not all that different, but I believe that a public official has a duty to cooperate uh, when you have uh, an official body that wants the truth. And it blew me away when you exercised your Fifth Amendment right, which you're allowed to do, but you are a public official. And it bugs the heck out of me that we've had to delay six months what you could have answered. I've heard nothing that you said today that you couldn't have said back then. Um, my view is the Fifth Amendment gives you the right not to incriminate yourself. And you have the right to use it. And the courts have made it very clear that you can't convict someone it. But it doesn't say what public opinion has a right to think or what a congressional hearing has a right to think about the exercise of anyone using that right. And so my natural instinct is to think, what do you have to hide? And I've listened to you, and you've used as an excuse that your memory might not be good enough and that, therefore, uh, you don't want to you know, do something where your memory isn't good enough. But whatever you say here, whatever you say here, has to be the truth. And your immunity doesn't protect you from lying before us. You were sworn in, correct. Any, everything you say here has to be the truth, correct? Yeah, exactly or you, right. Or you, in fact, can be prosecuted. Is that not That's true? That's exactly right. Okay. Congressman. Um, so I'm just, I'm just, like, mystified. I want you to tell me what you think about Joseph and Marie Salvati. Joseph Henry Salvati, the gentleman who's uh, spent a, I have the same sense of uh, outrage, the same sense of uh, actually revulsion at the, um, the uh, story of Mr. Salvati and the other two defendants who were wrongfully convicted and uh, sent to jail for all those years. And I, uh, I, Mrs. Salvati, I've met her on occasion, and she's, she knows of my feeling on that. Does it bother you that you help provide an environment in which it seemed difficult for uh, law enforcement agencies to get at the truth? Does it bother you that the FBI was involved with sending this man to jail when he was innocent? Does it bother you that your brother was involved with sending this man to jail when he was innocent? I want to know what you think about your brother's involvement in this outrageous, obscene, gross circumstance. This is the very first I have ever heard of my brother's involvement in that, Congressman. The very first. The very first? Yes. Yeah. So somehow he just wasn't connected with this in any way. Somehow he was not connected with it? Yeah. No. In any way with the Salvati case? I don't believe so. Okay. It's the very first I've ever heard of it. You've never heard anyone suggest that before? No. Okay. Let me ask you, um, when you received the phone call, um, you received, your brother fled in December 94, and you received the phone call in January of 95, correct? Correct. Okay, your brother broke the law, and you were a public official. Did you go to the authorities to say that your brother had contacted you? I, I informed my attorney just about immediately. Did you go to the officials? No. Why not? 
I told my attorney, and well, he in turn, deal. and he, he uh, in turn told the officials. Okay, and and who interviewed you after that? Why wouldn't you just offhand? Why do you have to tell the attorney? Why don't you just? You're, a, you, I think you're a senator, correct? Pardon me. You're a, a st you were a state senator at the time. Uh, yes. Do you, why wouldn't you have just gone to the official? Why do you need to speak through your attorney to tell the authorities that you spoke to your brother? Why I have a right to do so. I exercise my right to... Um, but why? I, you have a right to do it, but why would you do it? Why wouldn't you just pick up the phone and say, my brother who's fled contacted me, and by the way, I'd like to know why you just didn't speak to the, attorney, uh, to the authorities directly. Why did you speak through an attorney? That was my preference. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, the individual who told you that you were to go to a house, his name was Kevin Weeks? Right. Uh, whose house did you go to? He asked me not, he didn't tell me to go to a house. He asked me where I would be. And where were you? And I went to the, I was, in the course of my duties that day, I was at a, a home in uh, Quincy, the home, home? of... Uh, Whose home? Uh, Edward Phillips. So you, you spoke to your brother uh, at Edward Phillips' home. Right. Um, did Mr. Phillips know you were going to receive that call? I can't remember whether Why not? he knew. I, just, I don't know whether I informed him that Wait, I was so receiving. You, you, you came to that home and you said, I'm going to receive a phone call from somebody or I need to come to this home. Tell when, me no, how when I go to this, No, when I go to this home, very frequently I'm receiving phone calls wherever I am. And it would not be unusual at all for me to receive a phone call while at his home. But you knew that when you went to that home, you were going to receive a phone call from your brother. I expected that I might. Right. Why did you think you would receive it there? Why was your brother calling that That home? was his request. I'm sure he would like a private conversation. Did the FBI ask you why you received the call there? Yeah. I'm reminded by counsel that the U.S. attorney asked me in the grand jury. Yeah, when was the grand jury? When? Yeah. In 2001. Isn't that amazing? You receive a call in 1995, and nobody wanted to have details of why you went there and whether or not that individual knew you were receiving the call and so on. It didn't strike you as kind of interesting? I think the U.S. Attorney's Office knew about it far in advance. Yeah, the problem is that there is a suspicion, which you obviously don't agree with, that the FBI and others were intimidated in interacting with you because you were a powerful political person. And you know you were a powerful political person. Did the FBI ever try to question you, and did you refuse to talk to them or answer them? Did you ever shoo them away? Did you ever suggest that maybe they should go somewhere else? Did you ever do that under oath? I'm asking you under oath if you did that. I think whenever they have come, I, I uh, told them I'd like to, I would not, if I'm going to talk to them, I want to do so with counsel. Did you ever suggest to them to get lost? No. Did you ever suggest to them uh, that you did not want to answer their questions? I don't recall, but I know that if they... Uh, so if we have someone from the FBI who comes up to us in a hearing and says, we went to, this, to Mr. Bulger, we asked him, and he told us to get lost. Uh, you I don't think I use that expression. Ever. Well, it's, you, you get the gist. Maybe they don't say get lost up in Boston, but you get the idea of what I'm suggesting. Not you, willing to cooperate. Are you, are you, you suggesting, suggesting? I'm, I'm suggesting that I'm asking whether you gave a signal to the FBI that you did not want to answer their questions and that they should not ask you and that they should leave. I don't recall meeting the FBI. I really don't recall it. Did the I'm, FBI ever come to your home? I'm told that they did, but I do not recall it. Uh, did the FBI ever come to your offices? No, I don't think so. Did any other law enforcement people come to your home? I don't think so. Did any law enforcement people come to your offices to ask you questions? I don't believe so. Do you think the FBI felt that if they asked you questions about your brother that you would cooperate? 
I have no idea what the FBI is thinking. They're not too friendly to me, Congressman. I'm not friendly because I'm outraged. No, at I'm this saying the case. FBI is not very friendly to me. Yeah, I don't blame them. Um, let me ask you this question. Well, you can understand then, if you don't mind, Congressman, why I would therefore be reluctant to be uh, cooperative with them. No, I don't understand that. The fact that someone may not like you doesn't mean you can't tell the truth. That's an absurdity. Um, let me ask you in the final area. Uh, did you have any knowledge of any organizations or people that were involved in gun running to Northern Ireland? No. Did you, were you aware that your brother was involved in any way, in any way with providing some kind of munitions to Northern Ireland? I read that in the paper. When did you read it in the paper? I don't know, the year, I have no idea. How did you react? It's in the 90s. When you read about it, were you proud of him? I didn't even know whether it was true or false, Congressman. I don't know how I felt. Is this the question that yeah, I'm here I, for, yeah, to I'd answer like what, how I feel about things? Yeah, yeah. At I, any given time, you know, I don't not, know. That's not an unusual question, because it gives me a sense of your attitude about a variety of things. I just want to know, do you know any, anything relating to Valhalla? No, I know nothing about it. Yeah. Let me just conclude with these uh, questions about your... Uh, you have um, a variety of children. Um, were any of your children in, um, interviewed by the FBI about anything to do with their uncle or anything to do, um, uh, anything to do with oh, your brother and their, or their uncle? Oh, yes, they have been. Okay, they've been interviewed, but you haven't been? Well, they've been... I'm trying to think of how they've been approached, and then once counsel uh, called them, uh, that that was, I think, the end of it each time. So, so the bottom line is, when anybody approaches you or your family, they're told to speak to counsel. That would be a, a sensible uh, attitude. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I ask questions, Mr. Lotteret, did you have some follow-ups, real quick? I, I just wanted to ask a couple questions. I, uh, from chatting with you the other day and, and also listening to you today, I, I get the sense that your family is, is close, you and your nine children, and you have a, a pretty close-knit family. Did that, did, did that exist in, your, in terms of your relationship with your brother? And by that, I mean, over the course of the years, like most families, did you get together for Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter? Uh, did you have family get-togethers like that? The, the Where family, your brother would be present? No, he would not be, uh, he would not be on hand for such occasions. Uh, and then whether or not those events occurred, what, what was your understanding that y your brother did for a living? I mean, how did, how did he, he had a lot of money. What was your understanding? Of no, I answered uh, Congressman earlier that uh, I recognized that um, he was uh, doing things that were um, extra legal. They were beyond the law at some point. All right, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. L let me ask a, a few questions here. Uh, you, uh, you indicated the first that you heard that your brother might have been aware of the killing of Deegan. And, Deegan. Uh, Deegan was the gentleman that was killed, uh, that they accused Mr. Salvati mm -hmm. of being involved with, as well as the others. Uh, you indicated you didn't think your brother knew anything about that, or at least this is the first you've heard about it, if that's the case. Is that right? That my brother did not know anything about it? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that he was. That was not my intention to say that, I'm sure. Um, well, the only everyone. I just wanted to clarify one thing. The Winter Hill mob or gang or whatever you want to call it, uh, he was pretty much the head of it. And Barboza and Fleming uh, and those guys, they answered to Patriarch up there who was north of them up, in, I believe, in Connecticut. And when they gave the approval to kill Deegan, uh, I'm sure that they had to know that. I'm sure he had to know that Deegan was going to get hit. Could I ask you what year that was, Congressman? I have... uh, what year was that? When is it? What's what year was it? 1965. Who was? Oh, is that right? Okay. I think it's the year my brother was released from prison, 1965. So I. He, he nevertheless was very tightly uh, involved with all these guys. He, he was. Well, he was the head of the Winter Hill mob, to, uh, as far as I know. Isn't that correct? <laughs> He, he was... I know he was in Alcatraz. 
Right, and I don't think he could, he could manage it from there. I'm not being, I don't mean to be uh, seeming, I, excuse me for that. I, no, but I mean, there, that's the, my problem with this. I understand. You see my problem? You, uh, earlier, uh, you said that uh, uh, Linda Reardon, who left with uh, your brother, uh, he came back, and you said that uh, she uh, did not get a job with uh, the, uh, was it yeah. Linda Reardon? I think it's Teresa Stanley, sir. Uh, Teresa Stanley, excuse me, I've got the wrong sheet here. Teresa Stanley, that she didn't get a job at the convention center from uh, your friend. I but don't know it, that she did. I it, just, I didn't was, think she had worked there. No, it was her daughter. I, I her just daughter. I want okay. to correct that for the record. Do you know whether John Connolly ever tipped your brother off uh, uh, to the fact that a criminal investigation was underway? With respect to... Do, do I... No, I don't know of it, no. Uh, did you consider writing a letter to Judge Terrell regarding Connolly's sentencing? Did I consider writing a letter? To Judge Terrell regarding the sentencing of uh, Mr. Connolly? No. Did you encourage any others to write letters? I don't believe so. Well, you say you don't believe so. C could you be more Well, specific? I know I've never called anyone, Congressman, and said, Mr. Chairman, and said to him, uh, please write a letter. There was nothing of that did nature. You, did ever. you ever talk to anybody on the street and say, you know, Conley's a friend of mine and appreciate if you'd write a letter to the No, judge? I don't think so, ever. You don't think so? No. So categorically you're saying you never did that? I'm categorically telling you that I have no recollection of such a thing. I know, you have no recollection, but you can't say for sure that you didn't ask somebody to write a letter to the judge on his behalf. I believe I never asked anyone to write a letter to Mr. Connolly. Never. Did you encourage... Uh, did Conley introduce you to uh, John Morris uh, and any other FBI agents? Yes, along the way he did introduce me to um, FBI people. I don't recall this meeting, our uh, introduction to uh, John Morris, but um, I, hear, I hear it frequently that Mr. Morris claims that there was such an introduction. Now, I don't know if you answered this question. I was out of the room for part of the time. Did you ever take any steps to help Conley get the police commissioner of Boston position? Did you ever refer him to anyone for that job? Okay, can you give me an idea of the year of that? Uh, well, I presume it was right after his retirement party, which would have been around, around 1990. 90. And that was when he went to work, I think, for the Edison uh, Company. But did you recommend him for that position as police commissioner of Boston? Excuse me, who's, I, who's the mayor at that time? Oh. Um, what about, uh, well, uh, maybe way back, many years before, there was a neighbor of ours who was mayor, and I've heard that I may have suggested John to Raymond Flynn. He was the, he was the mayor some, um, some years back. Well, did, you ever, did, you, did you try to help Conley get other jobs? I mean, like at Edison, I guess you did. No. You did not? That's the only time that you can recall? No, I think, and it wasn't even a... You know, it wasn't even an effort, it wouldn't qualify as an effort to get the man a job. I may have suggested him as a possible um, candidate, somebody that might be looked at. When you got that phone call, uh, did, did, did you know in advance uh, how far in advance you were going to get that call? Yeah. I've, I've answered that question before. I, I'm not positive. It seems as though it was very uh, close to the time that I'd be um, in Quincy, where the fall... Well, fall. I, I just wonder uh, if, if maybe uh, you felt it might be better to get a call someplace besides either your office or your residence because your phone or something might be tapped. Mm-hmm. Well, no, I... This uh, request was one uh, as to where I would be at a certain time of day and... Uh, and I was quite certain I would be there at that particular place. Well, if you knew you were getting a call from your brother who was gone and fled, why would you go to somebody else's house instead of your own to get the call or go to your office because he was your brother after all? Right. 
mean, why would you just say, well, you know, I'll be someplace, you can give me a call if you get a chance. I mean, if he was on the lam, mm -hmm. uh, you, you would know that uh, he wouldn't be, he might not be able to make three or four phone calls chasing you down if you were going to different places. No, so, I, so, I answered where I would be. I was pretty sure I'd be down at uh, Philip's house that evening. And of course you knew that Phillips would, there wasn't any chance that anybody would be listening in on that phone conversation down there. Well, it, it was the, um, my brother's request that he wanted to talk to me. Yeah, going back to the uh, State Street episode, uh, you gave the $240,000 back because it came from Brown. Right. Uh, did he get the $240,000 back when the money came? Uh, did you get the money back when it came from uh, other sources? You got, you got, ended up getting a fee, right? No, no, I, I, I got the money to which I was entitled. And I had done other work in that office. And uh, I, because I now was in a more uh, difficult position as president of the Senate, I had to step away from the formal practice of law uh, as a partner of uh, Mr. Finity. And, but it, uh, it had nothing to do with the first first issue, the first case, the $240,000. No, but the first, the, the, the money was some, something in the nature of an advance. Finity was working on a particular matter with Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown um, had a degree of notoriety, which um, caused me to say to uh, Finity, why, why don't I just, since the money's coming uh, as an immediate, uh, immediately from Mr. Brown, I should probably not receive it. I had, it was more to do with um, appearances. I don't think, I didn't think there's anything substantively wrong. Nevertheless. It turned out to be Tom Finity's money. He could do whatever he wanted with it. Nevertheless, the $240,000, you did receive $240,000 later. Later? Oh, Which much more than that, I hope. No, but more, because I, had, I was entitled to a fee. I think when you, we may have covered this when well, you, you did. Of, you did. I think it was a, uh, uh, What happened was I had a fee coming for about $350,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was expecting that. Ultimately, that did come. But, the, uh, this but whole it had nothing to do with the $240,000 that you gave back. No, that's a totally different matter. I see my time's expired, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just uh, try to round out on that subject. Uh, what was the name of the trust? from which you took the $240,000? The St. Patolf Trust. Okay, and for what purpose was that trust established? Well, Finity established the trust. It was his, he did it, I think, just for the sake of uh, separating some assets in his office. He ran the office. Who were the trustees? I think just himself. And who were the beneficiaries? I think just himself, I don't know. I think it doesn't stand the test of a real trust, ultimately. Have you seen the documents? I, well, way back, I think I did. And I, it was the fact that he's the, uh, he's the beneficiary as well as the... Uh, trustee? Trustee. He's the only beneficiary I and the only trustee? Him. Yeah, he was everything in that trust, yeah. And nobody else shared either of those positions, so in fact it wasn't a trust? Yeah, I, think, I think that's... Okay. I'm remembering that from... Your Dr. Days, Emil, Emil my days. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, so when you took that money, you didn't take it as a beneficiary? It was oh, some no. other form of transfer? It was just his... He was free to do, pay it as he wished. And you didn't take it as a beneficiary? You took it as, as some other... Oh, no. Other it, was, it was really because the other money was coming, it was slowed up. And I think he had some sense at the time um, that it, the slow up on the other fee, which I had earned, was something which... Um, was the fault of the office. They had not been uh, receiving the money on time due to some uh, inaction of their own. But as, as you testified just a short while ago, is that when you received that money, you, you invested it? A, a few, yes, I did some of it, yeah. Do, were there immediate needs that you, that you had to meet with that money? Well, were were you putting pressure on Mr. Finity for it? I don't think I did. Okay. But, so, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why he felt compelled to have to give an advance when everybody knew the fee was coming in eventually I don't think and he you felt had no apparent need for it. Yeah. My sense of it is now, so many years later, it's 15 years, uh, maybe more, must be longer. My sense of it is that he, he just wanted to do it. There, there were needs, 
nothing critical, I don't think, but it would be um, something he would be uh, willing to do. Can you tell me how much of uh, that money went toward needs that you had and how much of it got invested? Well, only a very, I never, I didn't have it very long. I didn't put it toward needs. Just a very little bit of a 10 or $15,000, I think, was invested. When that money was paid back, uh, did you make the check out to this affinity or to the trust? I assume it was to the trust, okay. I assume. And did any of the money which you used to, to reimburse the trust come from James Bulger or oh, any no. of his associates? No. Now, you had testified earlier also that Mr. Connolly, from time to time, brought by various FBI personnel to your Senate office to introduce them to you. Sure. Do you know what the frequency of those visits were? It would be occasionally, maybe, I, I think if new people were coming to town, he might come by and introduce them. Did he visit your office on other occasions? I, he may have. I have some sense that he was around a bit, but he, was, he knew everyone, nearly everyone who worked for me. And I think frequently that was the reason for his presence there. Was that he had associations with other people in your office? He was friendly with, many, with several people, yeah. Did you have periodic telephone conversations with Mr. Connolly while you were in the state senate? Would he no. call your office? Uh, Not very frequently, no. And when he would call, what were the uh, topics that he'd discuss with you? Um, I don't know. He might ask me if I would, um, um, I don't know, be, be an MC at something. That was always a uh, request that I would receive. I, I think I visited every senatorial district in Massachusetts doing that, Democrat and Republican. And Mr. Connolly would ask you to do that? But I, he would do that, too. If there was some event that he were interested in, if there were a, a charitable event or something. And I think I recall his asking me on some such event, would you come and be the MC? Might it and is it your testimony that in none of those telephone conversations and in none of those personal visits between you and Mr. Connolly was the subject of James Bulger uh, entertained? I, I don't no, I, it was, no, he didn't. He just didn't. He, there's an awareness on the part of people that my brother is there, Congressman. But there right, are people this individual is somebody that you and your brother grew up in the same neighborhood with him. You have a long-standing relationship. Yeah. He's in the FBI. He's running your brother as a, as a confidential informant. Right. And he never mentions anything of that to he you. He doesn't tell me about it. He does not. He, he, I think, years later, as he's leaving, maybe around 1990 or thereabouts, I'm... It, it's becoming clearer and clearer that they all know each other. He knows my brother. But I don't think I ever was even aware of it until much later. You know, can I just... Sure. An, an example. Uh, Governor Weld uh, served uh, for, I don't know, seven years as governor of Massachusetts. And we were very close during the fi five years in which I was still the president of the Senate. He never mentioned my brother, never once. And we had traveled together, and we, we had worked together to resolve some of the problems that confront both the House and the Senate and the governor. And I can only say he never mentioned it. And that is not an unusual um, uh, way that the fact of my brother's presence uh, was handled. Everyone knew about my brother, but it frequently was just something that didn't get referred to. Mr. Bowles, you, you wrote Can I that... Have one moment, Mr. Chairman? Sure. We do have to... Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm reminded by counsel that one time I did ask John Connolly about some... It was in the paper that my brother was involved in drugs. And I began, to, I think, asking people about that because I didn't think it was something that could go on without a lot of people being aware of it. And I asked him, and I asked him if he, you know, if he could find out within his right to know. And he came back to me and said, it gave me a negative on it. He said he didn't think that was so. Well, earlier, 
when we talked about what it is that you thought your brother did, you indicated you thought that he was involved with uh, numbers and yeah. things of that nature. How come you never asked John uh, Connolly then if your brother was engaged? Well, because in those I, I, I thought that was, I thought there was validity to it. In the case of this drug business, I, I, um, I thought it was false, and it was something a claim made against him that was false. I asked other people about it too. But you never asked Connolly the extent that your brother might be involved in gaming or anything no. of that nature? No, I didn't. No. You never asked him if, if, if your brother was in trouble with the FBI or other law enforcement officials, or should I you don't talk believe to your I did. about it? I, didn't, I don't believe I did. I didn't think it was within my right to inquire uh, or that it was in his right to tell me. You wrote uh, a while back that your wife at one time called you and informed you that uh, your brother and a group of people purchased a lottery ticket together and that... Uh, the ticket had been bought jointly, it's apparently a $1 ticket we're talking about here, had been bought jointly by Mike Linsky and his brother Patty, Kevin Weeks, and Jim. Half of the purchase price, I guess 50 cents, was paid by Mike, who was thus entitled to half the proceeds of the $14.3 million prize. The remaining half was divided equally among Patty, Jim, and Kevin. And my brother's share amounted to about $1.6 million. Um, do you have any idea? Uh, what your brother now, who would have received $80,000 a year, I guess, over 20 years. Do you have any idea where your brother may have uh, invested or spent that money during the five years before his disappearance? No, I don't know where he spent that money. No. Do you know if he took it as a lump sum or if he did take it over the periodic payment period? I don't think he took the lump sum okay. because there was a squabble about whether it's, it was a valid uh, win. As you might, okay. The, uh, you testified at one point, or there was information at one point, that uh, your brother had a safe deposit box in London uh, with your name on it. Uh, what knowledge did you have about that box, and when did you uh, acquire knowledge yeah. about it? Whenever it appeared in the newspapers, the first I knew of it. I understand I'm not a joint, but rather somebody to whom they would go if there were no one else about. In that phone conversation that you had with your brother, he never mentioned to you uh, that never. this never was the case in case something happened to him? No, he never told me that. I don't think he, he'd he know that I would tell him I don't want to be uh, on it. Do you know of any other safe deposit box belonging to your brother James? No, I've heard of one in Florida, which has been uh, involved. Uh, and how did you hear about that? Pardon me? How did you hear about that? Because my brother Jack was paying the, uh, the bill for it, whatever, the annual bill. Okay. It, was your name on that one also? Oh, no. Okay. Do you have any financial interest in any money or property or business that's uh, owned in part by your brother no, James? No, not at all. Do you have any awareness of any assets belonging to James uh, and, and where they might be at this point in time? No. Have you ever received any large gifts? with a value of $1,000 or more from your brother James. No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lynch? Thank you. Let me, let me continue. I just have a, a few questions, but let me just continue on that line of questioning. Uh, based on earlier testimony by, I believe, Mr. Weeks, Mr. Matarano, and actually confirmed by Mr. Morris, for a certain period of time, there was an awful lot of money flowing between the FBI agents themselves and other third parties, as well as uh, your brother and Mr. Flemmy and their organization. Uh, were you ever confronted with an offer of uh, money, either from the FBI or from, uh, from anybody in your uh, brother's, any of your brother's associates like Kevin Weeks or any of those uh, gentlemen that are affiliated with your brother's no. organization? Never. Never, no. Okay. An offer of money to me? Correct. From, from... From either an FBI agent? No. Or from... No. All right, even, even uh, an unexpected offer of money from an unknown third party? No. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Meehan. This will be my final question on the 75 St State Street. B 
before you um, you paid back the money, had anyone suggested to you that uh, Harold Brown was going to be indicted? No. So the, the, there was no, you never had a discussion with anyone relative to Harold Brown uh, potentially being? No, I didn't know much about Harold Brown at all. And, um, but um, it became pretty clear that he was in some sort of uh, difficulty. And I'm not sure how I came to know it, but uh, I thought it would be advisable that uh, since that was its, uh, the, the money, the source was from him. And Spinetti, by the way, was suing him, I think, at, by that time. And uh, that it would not be uh, sensible for me to receive that money, since I already have the other money coming before long. The, I think Tom Finnerty was trying to be helpful to me. He had it, and he thought that that would be some help to me. Um, going back to the telephone conversation, uh, in 1995, when you went to uh, uh, your staff person's house, um, you knew that you were going to get a call. I, I'm, it's not clear to me. Did you know you were going to get a call from, um, from your brother? Well, I, you know, I still don't have a specific recollection, as I've indicated, about the conversation with Kevin Weeks. But you've I testified that, that, that the information came from Kevin Weeks. Right, I have. But I've also said, I hope each time, that I don't remember exactly the conversation. I, settle on weeks because I don't know anyone else, I didn't know anyone else then who um, ever seemed to be in touch with my brother. And this is the same Kevin Weeks who was involved in the Logan Airport incident in 1987 where uh, he escaped apparently with the, mm. with the money. And, um, and this is the same Kevin Weeks that um, uh, the issue of the lottery ticket, uh, apparently he was involved in this maybe still in dispute of extorting a $14 million winning um, ticket from the first person who won it, Th that was Kevin Weeks? That's the first, I didn't know that that, is that, a, a, I didn't know that that was a claim. I, I think he's testified, uh, I think he's that testified he did? to that. Yeah, I, d I didn't know that. And this is the same Kevin Weeks who along with, um, apparently along with your brother and Steve Fleming, um, at least according to his testimony, forced legitimate owners of a South Boston liquor store to sell them the business, apparently according to Mr. Weeks at gunpoint, in 1984. And I think it's the same Kevin Weeks who, at least according to his testimony, uh, has said that he participated in, in burying bodies all over the, uh, apparently all over South Boston. Um, is it fair to say John Connolly was a close friend? Of mine? Yeah. Yes. And John Connolly and John Morris apparently were friends. I didn't think you so. You don't know that. You don't know that. I John Morris was the, apparently was the uh, mm -hmm. uh, agent in charge mm -hmm. of Connolly. But you, are you aware of that? Pardon me? Are you aware that he, uh, Morris was I think the he agent? was, yes. I think I was aware of that too. On the issue of, of the safe deposit box in 1997, you, you never ever got notification that your name was on the box? No. Is that correct? Never. And was your phone conversation or not a telephone conversation relative to that box? It seems it, it's unclear to me whether or not... Well, I think there was some claim, I'm remembering the newspaper reports, that at some place something was changed. I don't even know the name of the bank but that uh, that was communicated. And my sense of it is that it was communicated by uh, telephone. But I, no one seems to have heard that. You know? So you never knew that he had put your name on, no. on this box in, in London, and, and your name wasn't on the one in Florida, and apparently you heard of the one in Florida only through right. your brother Jack. After the phone call, you've testified. After the phone call um, from your brother, you've testified that you notified your attorney. Well, I did tell my attorney that I had received the phone call. I didn't. You've stated that that was your last conversation uh, in 1995. And have you received any other information from any source um, 
relative to, to your brother? Well, back in 95, uh, there were people who, they all seemed to uh, claim to have received a phone call or, or were aware through someone else who had that he was doing fine or something like that. Now, I would hear it through third parties, and uh, that seemed to be sort of a common bit of uh, information. So information would get to you generally through third parties relative to I how he was doing? Oh, I think a, so, yeah. Um, do you recall the names of any of those third parties? Well, no, I remember the incidents, some of them, people. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, that um, there was a young lady named Kathy McDonough. I did not know her at the time. I since have come to know her, and I'm un I understand that she had received such a call. And then there was someone named, uh, I said Hart, I don't know, that might be uh, Caputo, and she was someone who was a friend of um, Teresa Stanley. She may have received a phone, phone call. I'm not sure of that. But Any then, um, and then there were some folks who made large claims that were just, <laughs> just uh, the, the usual things you hear, you know, they were, that were false. On a separate subject, do you, do you know a man named Roger Concanon? Yes. Yeah. Um, how do you know him? What, what's your relationship with him? Well, Roger grew up in that community. I know his brother, for the most part, James. Have you ever been to his home? Roger? No. Has he been to your home? Is it a, are you close friends? No. I don't think I've seen him in years and years. Are you uh, familiar with a musical group called the Irish Volunteers? Musical group, yes. Um, it's very flattering. And, and you know, th they were, <laughs> they would perform with the group. Is that right? Roger did, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, it, did you ever hire them to perform at, at events? Oh, I'm sure I did. But they were, yeah, they were, yes, I, I know who they were are. Were they any good? Well, you know, well, I'm not a can. <laughs> no, I, uh, I uh, would not recommend them. <laughs> I would also say that, uh, well, I used to chide them. Do you want to hear that? I know. I used to say it's a nice group. They <coughs> pull themselves out as volunteers. The trouble's 3,000 miles away, and they're here. You know? uh, are you aware that uh, Roger and Bill Driscoll own the Coconut Beach Inn? No. I don't know that place. I never heard of it. Coconut Beach? Coconut Beach Inn. Have you ever been to St. Vincent? Pardon me? Have you ever been to St. Vincent in the Caribbean? No. I was going to... I know none of St. Vincent's. Okay. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. That's it for now. <coughs> Mr. Delahunt? <coughs> yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned Teresa Stanley. Um, I'm sure you're curious about the whereabouts of your, your brother. Have you ever had a conversation with Teresa Stanley since she returned uh, to Boston? I have... Uh, After your brother dropped her off. Yeah, I, I did. I saw her at a, a couple of uh, events, and I've seen her a few times, and, uh, but she becomes very silent, very quiet about things. I don't bring up those subjects, but uh, even the chance meetings uh, seem to be um, subdued. She doesn't, uh, I don't know what, it, but she, she's very polite and very... Um, well, you've had no conversation with her about your brother? No. Um, I just want to name uh, some FBI officials and determine whether you know them. Mm -hmm. And if you do, how you know them. Um, a James Ring, Jim Ring. Jim Ring, I do know that name, and I think I've met him. Do you remember where you met him? No, I don't, I don't remember meeting him at this alleged uh, chance meeting at uh, Mary Flemmy's home. But that's where I've seen his name. I don't remember that. I told you, but it's 20, I think, 20 years. Mm -hmm. You're familiar, though, with, uh, with his testimony? Yes. Uh, regarding 
your appearance at the Fleming household I think while he was there with uh, mm. uh, John Conley mm -hmm. and uh, your brother and Stephen mm. Fleming? Yes. And you have no memory? No, I could, I could not have seen that. I would have, I just, I never saw that. Uh, have you ever met a Dennis O'Callaghan? I don't know that I have. I hear, I know the name. He was a former uh, assistant special agent in charge? Yes, I know the name. But you don't remember meeting him? I don't remember meeting him. Mm -hmm. Are you aware that there is testimony that was given uh, in the federal court that uh, it was Dennis O'Callaghan that provided John Connolly information relative to the indictment of your brother? I didn't know that, no. You didn't. Um, there is a, do you know this name? A Richard Baker would be a special agent. Richard Baker, no. No. Uh, there were reports that uh, pursuant to um, a recommendation or instructions from John Conley, he purchased uh, liquor from the South Boston Liquor Mart that purportedly was owned by, uh, by your brother mm -hmm. after the incident that was uh, just related by, uh, by Mr. Meehan. But you don't remember, you don't know a Richard Baker. No, and Richard Baker is an, an FBI agent. I don't know him, no. Uh, a James Ahern. I know that name. Um, he was a former special agent in charge in Boston. Right. I, I, I don't, I, I'm sure I must have met uh, him at some point, but I don't recall him or I don't recall ever having any conversation with him. But mm -hmm. I do know he was, I think he was very much in the news. Yes, he was very much in the news. Um, do you remember a, a John Clarity, Jack Clarity? Yes, I do. I think I know his sister. You know his sister? Yeah. But you know Jack Clarity? If he's from West Roxbury, mm -hmm. then I think I know him. Do you remember being, uh, again, a master of ceremonies at his retirement party? Jack Clarity's? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I don't. You don't? I could have done it, though. I did it all the time. But you don't have a memory of... I don't have a specific memory. If you told me when and where it occur took place, I, I might... I think it was actually of June of... If you give me a moment. Sure. I think it was June of 1989. Mm-hmm. And, and the place... Uh, I don't know the name of the yeah. place. I just... I could very well have been. I know... Um, I know his sister, she worked at the State House. For her name was Haggerty, as I remember. Yeah, she, mm -hmm. she, and she always mentioned her brother, as though we, were, we knew each other. You know? mm -hmm. Others have indicated that uh, on multiple occasions, John Conley would uh, uh, introduce you either at your office or elsewhere to members of the FBI. He, he, at his house? Not at his house, no. Either at your, uh, I'm sorry, either at your office or... That's how I remember um, him coming through. Someone knew was in town and would you like to say hello and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But that's very common. Lots of people uh, did it. The place was open for traffic all of the time. I understand, but, uh, you know, others have asked the frequency. I'm not asking... Oh, but I don't know how... It, it, it wasn't very frequent, I'm sure. If there were a couple of times a year, that would be about the way I would think of it. But one inference could be drawn that Mr. Conley enhanced his own status uh, by bringing um, FBI officials in to meet the president of the Massachusetts Senate. That's an inference that could be drawn, would you? Sure. Agree? We um, assume that anyone who comes through and it's, is uh, doing it um, 
either a social purpose or a uh, self-promotion purpose, but I think it happens to all of us in public office. And let me just, again, I'm not interested in the facts of the 75 State Street. Sure. Um, because you've testified here that the statements that you provided uh, to the federal prosecutors <coughs> were the truth. Hmm. So I don't think there's any need for us, but by incorporation, um, you know, those statements could be made part of our record, and I would recommend to the chair that they be made part of our record. I hope you'll consider carefully, if I may, so, the, uh, the affidavit I've submitted from Harold Brown. Harold Brown seeks to set the record straight, and he uses the word um, that I was totally innocent, that he doesn't ever intend to accuse me of anything. I understand that, Mr. Bulger, and I'm not, and I think I'm confident that this committee will consider that. But if the chair would honor my request, if we can secure the statements of Mr. Bulger. Yeah, without objection. Thank you. Um, but what I find interesting is the um, Well, let me ask you this question, Mr. Bulger. Who represented you during uh, the 75 state Bob Popio. Bob Popio represented yeah. you. Did he ever raise with you the question of, uh, did he ever raise with you uh, an issue regarding a a request or a suggestion by the federal government that would entail that investigation being conducted by another United States Attorney's Office or by a different office of the FBI. I never heard of that. By the way, I, it had been already investigated. I understand that. And and then. I uh, went to a grand jury and they said no. And that I, day, and you know the... I, I, I understand yeah. that all and... And you know I, there were no accusers. And, and, the and accusers are the lawyers of... Um, well, let, let, me ex let me explain the reason, again, yeah. why I'm posing these questions. Is that while you testified here that you were unaware... I was what unaware? You were unaware that your brother was an informant Right. for the FBI. Right. The individuals that were either involved in the investigation of 75 State Street or even were in the periphery were fully aware of your brother's, of your brother's status as an informant. Um, but, but, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was re doing some reading last night, and in a story that was dated December 9th, 1988, uh, it appeared in, in the Globe indicating that the FBI had called off an investigation of some two and a half years into the matter involving 75 State Street. And I, I'm, I'm quoting now, uh, FBI agent John Clarity. Yesterday confirmed that there was a formal investigation started in March of 1986. This investigation failed to develop any evidence of a violation within the jurisdiction of the FBI. In December of 1988, as you've indicated, the investigation was closed. Um, let me just interpose a question here. Sure. At that point in time, it has been reported that you had never been interviewed by the FBI. Do you have a memory of being interviewed by the FBI as it related to 75 State Street? No, of course not. Thank you. Um, but they did go ahead and made an announcement closing the investigation. May I also, I think that's exactly the same time as the grand jury spoke and said there was nothing to... Now, 
I think it's the same. Uh, let me try to refresh your memory. The grand jury was subsequent to the announcement by the FBI. And obviously it was John Clarity who made that particular uh, uh, announcement. I never knew there was any kind of an investigation going on. I didn't. I, I, I don't. I'm not in any way suggesting that you did. Yeah. What I am saying, Mr. Bulger, is that the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Boston made an announcement that they were closing an investigation that you indicate of some two and a half years that you were unaware of and then made that announcement. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't happen very often with the FBI. Mm -hmm. In fact, back in December, I asked a question of the head of the Organized Crime Strike Force and the U.S. Attorney, Mr. O'Sullivan, um, regarding his statement after the grand jury uh, concluded its work and he made the announcement that it was not even a close call. And I posed the question to Mr. O'Sullivan, in your 16 years as a federal prosecutor, when, when did you ever <laughs> make an announcement that it was not a close call or that someone was vindicated. Now, I'm not suggesting that's a policy that should be rejected out of hand, but what I am saying, it's a very exceptional policy. Or it was, and he indicated, his response to me was that it was very rare and he could only think of a, a single, uh, maybe one, his words were maybe one other time and I requested that he, uh, as he left, to go reflect and submit to the committee a letter outlining that other time. And I don't think we've ever received that, have we, Mr. Uh, Not that I know, Mr. Chairman. No. Is it so, gentleman about concluding his uh, Mr. questions? Do you have more questions, sir? I do, Mr. But I'll be happy to. No, go ahead. Uh, we, we, there's continuity of questions that we want to make sure we get completed. But go ahead. I'll do whatever the chair, uh, the chair recommends. Um, and again, it was Mr. O'Sullivan that that reopened that, reopened that case, supervised that investigation, and presented okay. evidence to the grand jury which in a public statement he exonerated you. And I think right. his words were no close call. Um, um, but what I find interesting here yeah. is we have Morris, John Morris, whom you've made a, a serious allegation about here today, mm -hmm. who is in charge of that investigation. Uh, Mr. Ring, who was the special agent in charge, I'm strike that, Mr. Ahern, who was the special agent in charge of the Boston office, who clearly was not only aware of the informant status of your brother, but would sign off on any statement uh, that was made in, in the name of the FBI and also would have supervised uh, Mr. Morris. We have Mr. Clarity, who was the former partner of John Conley. Um, and in addition to that, we have, we have Mr. O'Sullivan who exonerated you. Um, and then we have uh, testimony from Morris that he was approached by Conley. And Conley sought his advice as to whether you should testify. Mm -hmm in front of the grand jury. I think you've indicated... It was, it was a, a meeting. There was a meeting. That was what it was. I was, I was my own request. I asked Popio if you, is there some way I could talk to these people? So it was not the grand jury, Congressman. It was the, a meeting with the prosecutors. No, this is prior to that, Mr. Mr. Bulger. There was an approach made by John Connolly to John Morris. Mm -hmm. And this has, this has been testimony, you know, in, in the federal well, I, court. I wasn't aware of that then, yeah. And what I'm trying to do is clarify the record because 
one could draw an inference that you requested John Connolly to make the approach to Morris. And be absolutely certain, I never made such a request. Never. But what I'm trying to relate to you is right. the testimony of John Morris that was never refuted by Mr. Connolly. Now, many things are said in our, all of our names that we are unaware of. But again, well, I guess the bottom line for me is that the federal authorities having knowledge that your brother was an informant and that you were either the subject of a target of an investigation concluded that it was fine uh -huh. for those that I uh, mentioned to proceed with the investigation into 75 State Street as opposed to referring the matter like occurs mm -hmm. frequently to either another FBI office or to another U.S. Attorney's office. Um, what I'm suggesting is that I have reservations as to whether that's a very good practice, particularly when several months after you are cleared that these same FBI officials uh, invite you to be a master of ceremonies for a departing member of the FBI. I think it, and again, I'm not leveling criticism at you, Mr. Bulger. What I am suggesting is that in terms of appearances and the confidence of people in our justice system, that just doesn't, as uh, the former Governor Weld, I think, once said, that doesn't pass the smell test. May I just say a couple of things? Sure. The, first of all, as to the publicity, at the very end, there was a, a whole, uh, it, it was a Boston Globe, um, I'd call it a concoction. And it ran from that time, about December 8th of 88, and it ran right to the March 31st. I remember it well because it was a daily, daily drumbeat upon me. And ultimately, um, Bob Popio, ask the people who were conducting this thing, please, um, there's never been so much publicity. If one were to go back and look at the publicity during that period, and he therefore asked if you would please just make a public announcement so that my own opportunity to be made whole would, would occur. Another thing about being a master of ceremonies, I have to tell you, I, I did it more, f I, I'll bet I was in master ceremonies for more state police than I have been for any FBI. I just did it all the time. It seemed to go okay. I'm just telling you it was a constant problem for me because um, people would so frequently ask me to do it. And it becomes difficult not to do so. I mean, Elliot Richardson, who was the United... Uh, would you please, he said, do it. And I did it with Art Buchwald and we retired his debt. And he was ever grateful, but Elliot Richardson, I mean, it was everyone, and I didn't know how to turn it off. And um, I did it all of the time. It's one of the things that in my opening statement I don't mention, but the fact is, these offices keep you very, very busy. And that was one of the, so there's nothing sinister about my having agreed to be and by the way, I don't even know about this. Uh, you, you know. Mr. Belgian, let me be really clear. I'm not even suggesting mm -hmm. sinister. Right. What I am suggesting is the responsibility of the office. My office? No, not your office. The office of the F FBI. Oh, okay. Because they were aware of the informant status of your brother. Right. They knew that your brother was mm -hmm. an informant for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And they proceeded to conduct an investigation into the matter involving 75 State Street. And I just say the appropriate mm. action by the government should have been to refer that matter sure. to another U.S. Attorney's Office, to another office of the FBI. And far be it for me, Mr. Bulger, to defend the globe. But 
they were correct in the information they provided relative to the status of your brother as an informant. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that it was Mr. Morris that was the source of that particular, uh, particular information. But that information did lead to, I dare say, the Wolf hearings, uh, the, the hearings of this particular committee that have really given us some insights into what was occurring within the Department of Justice, not just in Boston, no, but by implication that. elsewhere. I appreciate that, Congressman. I, I can't even be in disagreement with you on it, not at all. M Mr. Chairman, before we get off this round, can, can I ask one question on, on the subject? Right, I, I, mean, I want to get off this Coconut Grove in, uh, and I didn't ask the last question. I got a little sidetracked with the evaluation of the Irish volunteers and how they were, but I, I do want to ask um, this question. Uh, you indicated that you knew Roger and James Concannon, and uh, th there's a story in the, in the Herald today. I don't, I don't suppose you've had an opportunity to read the Herald yet, but I don't ever read it. <laughs> Um, I just want to ask you this. You had indicated you knew Roger and James. Have you ever spoken to them about your brother? To whom? Uh, Roger Concannon, James Concannon, or Bill Driscoll? I, I don't think I've ever spoken to Roger Concannon about my brother. I see Jim Concannon so frequently that uh, I could very well have. It, so you could have. Um, any idea what the content would have oh, been? Well, James? I, uh, Jim is a contemporary, and I see him once a week. And um, he's usually very supportive and that sort of thing. So I'd be probably just giving him some assurance that we're doing okay. And um, I can't remember discussing uh, my brother with him, though, Jim. Jim's so a probation officer. You, you, you never had a conversation with them about your brother potentially uh, being at the uh, Coconut Grove Inn or anything of that nature? The Coconut Grove Inn? I don't know where that is. Where is that? I, do you mind me asking that? Um, well, uh, yeah, it's in St. Vincent, uh, oh. Caribbean, Car the Caribbean, huh. apparently. Uh, but I just asked the question because it was in, uh, there was a piece today, and I just thought I would finish that off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, time on this side has expired. A gentleman from Indiana is recognized. I, I just have a few questions, Mr. Chairman, to kind of wrap up. Stevie Fleming, <coughs> uh, were you aware that uh, he had extensive uh, real estate holdings? I think only after he was um, in trouble, indicted. I, I read it in the paper. I didn't know of his, I was not aware of it before that. Well, did you ever talk to his mother uh, about him and well, what he did for a living or anything like that? No. His mother was just exactly next door to me, mm -hmm. just a few feet away. She's a very fine lady, Congressman, and she was really, she, she was seldom visited. She didn't have anybody after her husband died, and she would, um, I think, be kind of waiting when I come home or when I was going out. And uh, well, I, that, I, that, I understand that's laudable. Right. Uh, was he like your brother? Did, I mean, did, did you have any idea what he did for a living? No, I thought, he had, I thought he had a restaurant somewhere. And also, I thought he had a club or something like that, some club. Did you ever hear any rumors or anything that would indicate your brother was involved in some murders? Some place I saw it in the paper. I didn't I believe it, but I did see it someplace, and it was in the 80s. Now, all these, uh, after 1995, you were called in January, I think, in 1995, and he left uh, around Christmas in 1994. Right. Uh, can you give us a list of all the people that passed along information to you about Whitey and where he was and how he was doing, or is that a... a I couldn't, well, I've done it for uh, other authorities. I've well, told them about... Well, we'd like to have it here for the record, if you can give it okay, to us. Okay, well, I, I think that... Um, I think it's important to know how many times he contacted people. Yeah. Well, well I don't think that these... the only time he contacted you. I think Teresa was the... Teresa Stanley was the source of some uh, communications, because she had been with him and then was dropped off. Mm-hmm. That's and 
and one of his uh, daughter got the job at the con at the convention center. Right. Yeah. And um, I think, by the way, that youngster had worked at the convention center long before that. She's a very good employee, and she right. was savaged by the local press about being there, and she okay. left. She went someplace else. Okay. But um, the uh, who else? I I, I think the uh, the uh, Mrs. Caputo, mm -hmm. who I haven't spoken to in years, but I think she may have received a call. There's a gentleman at, um, that I used to meet, and I told the police about this. He was a retired policeman, and he told me that he had seen my brother in um, Maine and decided not to arrest him. Now, did they pass on to you anything specifically that Whitey said to them? No. He, he they didn't. He didn't say, "Tell, tell Billy, I'm, I'm fine," or didn't no, say, uh, "Merry no. Christmas" or anything. And, and when I was in public office, I listened to everyone. Frequently, knew better than to um, take them very seriously. He would fall into that category. He's a very nice fellow, but he could tell a wonderful story. If you, and that happens. And because, I mean, I just didn't go about saying to people, you are fibbing and you're telling the truth because they're all voting. Were there any so. other people in that list? And then there was, um, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know, that, bear in mind, this ended some eight years ago. It happened then and then nobody has said anything in years and years. So you don't recall anybody else other than those you mentioned? No. Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to be a little redundant, but I want to make sure we've got this for the record. When did uh, the FBI first interview after your brother fled Boston? Well, I'm informed now that they said they came to my house or something, and if, that's the, if they say that, then they probably came, but it would well, not have... Well, the information that we have on that is that about four days after yeah. he left, there was a knock on your door. You answered the door, they asked you a question, and you were supposed to have said... I don't have anything to say, and you just shut the door. Well... You don't recall that? Yeah, I don't remember it, you know, but my sense is if I did speak to them, I think I'd handle it much more diplomatically, and I'd say, uh, I have a lawyer, and would you... And I'd give them his name. Mm -hmm. Well, what other interviews were there? And they... Uh, with me or with other fa members with of the family? Oh, well... Um, no, I don't think uh, there were other interviews, no. Okay. Uh, were you concerned that your Senate office was bugged? No, I wasn't. Yeah. Did you ever ask anyone to conduct a sweep of your office to determine... I accepted the routine uh, sweep of the office. There was someone who, from one of the uh, police departments of the state... Suffolk County District Attorney's equipment was used? Something like that. And they would go through, I think they'd go through all of the constitutional offices and they'd make themselves, if you wanted to do it, fine. I think I said yes to it. That was a common practice for them to sweep your office? No. But whenever they, I think it probably happened once or twice. Did you ask them to sweep your no, office? No, I, ne I never went looking for anyone to do that. Never. You didn't say, you know, I'd like to have oh, my Oh, please, no, I didn't, no. No, I didn't say, oh, please come and do it, no. I didn't do well, that. How, how, how did it happen? Did they just say... I think that they, they called. The people who were doing it... They but they initiated it. the call? I believe so. No. I think so. I, again, it's years and years. I mean, you, it, 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 if, you, if you were concerned about your office being bugged, it seems to me you would recall and say, look, I'd like for you to sweep my office. Sure. Or if they just said, uh, you know, uh, we would like to come by and check your office for bugs. Yeah. Uh, you would, you would, you I don't, would know I don't the think difference. I, I don't think I ever felt that it was... Uh, necessary? Necessary. The only reason I ask that is you went to this other house to get that call from Whitey, and I just wondered if there was any correlation between that, having your office swept and... Uh, no. There wasn't? No. And you, 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 you don't... You, you did not ask them to sweep your office? I don't think so. I, no, no. You did not ask them to sweep your office. You didn't think so. Just a yes or no. Did you ask them to sweep your office? No. Thank you. Okay, I just have a few more questions. In your book, 
uh, you showed a great deal of contempt for informants. Uh, I, and you've covered this. You, you heard that your brother was an informant. I can't re re refresh my memory. How did you find out he was uh, an, an informant or alleged to be an informant? Uh, the very first was in this um, piece in the Globe in the late 80s. That's the first time I think it, that um, I, you know, my curiosity was piqued about this. What, what steps did you take to find out if it was true? I didn't take any steps. Did you talk to your brother about rumors that he was an informant? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, why, why he, my brother's an older brother congressman. He doesn't listen to, he didn't listen to, he didn't come to me looking for advice. Yeah, but it seems to me you'd remember if you said, are you an informant? I mean, that's a pretty significant thing. I mean, are you talking to the cops? You don't remember doing that? I don't think so, no. But you can't say categorically you didn't. I may have said it I, if I saw him, but I, you know, I doubt it. But you were curious about the truth of the Globe article. The truth of it was not as interesting to me as the other aspect that I have described. Did you, did you talk to John Connolly about your brother and whether he was a government informant? No. Did you talk to any friends or aides about the possibility that he was an informant? I don't think so. You didn't talk to anybody else that you recall? No. I think I know what I said about it. Well, I think I, I just have one more thing, Mr. Chairman, and that is uh, I'm very troubled by this Boston Herald ar article, not because of you, Mr. Bulger, but because how can a newspaper find out all this information and the FBI hasn't done anything about it? It just mystifies me. It says, uh, according to one policeman, these two guys didn't have one nickel to rub together, two nickels to rub together, and yet they paid uh, $130,000 at the outset plus another $27,000 for that hotel to buy up a uh, controlling interest in it. And that Whitey Bulger allegedly was down there and had the top two floors, and they've talked to people down there that said that uh, that was the case. And if that's the case and the Herald can find out about it, why in the world can't the FBI? So I don't know if we have any U.S. attorneys around, but guys, that kind of that kind of throws a little mud in, uh, on your ability to, to get one of the ten most wanted criminals in the country when a newspaper finds out about it and goes into great detail. With that, I uh, yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you very much. Are you doing okay? I was going to recognize counsel. Do you need a break, uh, Mr. Bolger? Are you okay? I'm doing fine. All right. Now let me recognize counsel for questions. Thank you, Mr. Bolger, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to ask a few follow-up questions, some things that have been raised today. Um, after your brother uh, returned to Boston uh, from Alcatraz, um, did you, uh, you tried to get him a job, isn't that right? Yes. And uh, what job was that? I got him a job in the, um, in the Suffolk County Courthouse, yeah. and, and the how long, janitorial. And how long did he stay in that job? Uh, some months, but not very long. Yeah. And do you know what he started to do after that? And do I know what? After he left that job, what did you, you know what he started to do? As a I think he was with a company that was doing billboard advertising. I think that's where he went next. And, and how long was he there? Excuse me? And how long was he there? I don't know. I think it, several years. Was that, a, was that a legitimate job, or was that something that he didn't really have to show up for? But well, I had assumed it was. When did you come to realize that your brother was engaged in criminal activity? Um, I'm uncertain of that. Very uncertain of that. Can you make a rough estimate of when you might have figured out that he was engaged in criminal activity, loan sharking, numbers, other, other mm -hmm. activities? Could I make a, a guess? A guess, yeah. A rough, it must be in the 70s sometime. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think you said that uh, uh, you certainly could have uh, asked John Connolly to look after him at some point. Isn't that true? Isn't that what you testified to? Yeah. Excuse me. This comes from a newspaper story, um, counsel, that... Um, well, it actually comes from John Martirano's testimony. Yes. 
And so he testified that you asked John Connolly to look after my brother. And he said that? Yes. To keep an eye on him. Keep him out of trouble, something like that. Yeah. Did, did I, I say that to, to whom? To John Connolly? To John Connolly, about your brother Whitey. And was Mr. Maharano there when I did? Was he present at uh, that? No, I don't, think he, I don't think he actually was there, but I think he, he understood that you had done that at I some see. point. Well, if, if I ever said something like, uh, boy, influence him to stay on the straight and narrow, if that's what's in, meant by it, I could well have said it. Yeah. But I never was. Uh, but the, the other construction is, uh, on, of my words is wrong. I don't know anything about what uh, Mr. Matarano has heard, and I forget who it was that uh, told him of it. Yeah. Um, but uh, do you think you would have said that at a time when um, knowing that John Connolly was an FBI agent and that your brother was engaged in criminal activity? Oh, no. I mean, I, I didn't intend that at all. Yeah. I think it's a pretty innocent and, uh, comment. If, in fact, I made it, I have no recollection, but I don't want to quarrel with that source. But it's not something, it's not something you, I mean, maybe it's something you would say to a lot of people, you know, just you know, keep, you know, keep an eye on somebody, you know, keep them out of trouble. It's not an unusual thing to say to somebody, is it? Do is it, you think it's unusual? No, I'm asking you if you think it's unusual. I don't think it's so unusual. Okay. But in the context of an FBI agent and a, and a person involved in crime, that might be an unusual thing to say. Um, oh, I suppose it, it could be, but it's not intended as it's purported to. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a few questions about Kevin Weeks. Um, what, what is your relationship with Kevin Weeks? I just know him from seeing him around. His brother was a friend of mine, or at least I knew him from the campaigning. Mm -hmm. He lives in Chicago. Um, Ke Kevin Weeks seems to be a, a, a person who um, uh, would, would come to you with information about your brother. I mean, he... he On is, several that, occasions, he, he, he would stop by. I think I'm the last one to... At the end of a day, he felt like talking and did not going home or something. Well, yes. Did you have any um, sort of you know, special relationship with Kevin Weeks, whereby he, you asked him to provide you with information about his brother, no. about your brother, rather? No. Um, was there any? Uh, um, w was there any um, special uh, treatment that Kevin Weeks was afforded in getting access to you? No. He. he um, I think I was inflicting my ad advice upon him. He, um, se he seems very young to me. His brother was in Chicago, and I know I told him that he should go to Chicago and that he should take his wife and family and, and go to Chicago. That's what I would tell him. So if, his, uh, if, if, he, if he made a phone call to your office, uh, would it... Would, would it automatically be put through? I don't think so. I, I, somebody would talk to him. I don't think he ever made a phone call ever to my office. Or to, uh, uh, what about visiting your office? If he visited your office, would I don't he believe you. I don't recall him? ever seeing him there. Where, where would you see him? He would stop by the house, and he would be coming. He'd come through unannounced. He'd suddenly. Uh, let me let me ask you some questions about uh, about your relationship with John Connolly. Um, mm -hmm. Do you recall uh, gatherings on Friday nights at, at something called the Bayside Club? No, Did I know the Bayside Club, but there were no big gatherings that I uh, attended. What, any kind of gatherings on? What, did you have a regular gathering of some sort on Friday nights anywhere? No. When when what years is this? Uh, in the early 1970s. In the early 1970s, I don't think so. Um, in, in your um, in your last conversation with your brother, um, did you discuss at all uh, any means of further communication with him? Did he say no. he would call you no. again? There you was no discussion of it. Mm -hmm. It was a it was um, the first few weeks. Mm -hmm. I thought the situation was temporary. Uh, let me ask you about um, your role as, se as Senate President and this outside budget item that keeps yeah. coming up. Um, have you been involved in other uh, outside budget items? I, 
I don't know. I, I probably must have at different times. Yeah. Do you have any formal responsibility for outside budget items? No. Does, uh, is, is there a practice in the state legislature that the leadership, as Mr. Meehan has, has asked, uh, uh, suggested that the leadership has to sign off on outside budget items? I don't know. The, um, the, budge the, uh, uh, the budget items come up um, as amendments, uh, outside section, and then the cr there is an up or down vote on them by the body, but they come from all directions. They come from the Committee on the Judiciary, the Committee on uh, Health, the Committee on Insurance and Taxation. And can, they, also can they be voted on without the approval of the leadership? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, let's go to the, um, the Billy Johnson uh, incident. Um, did you did you ever receive a copy of the uh, incident report? No. Um, now you mentioned that you also uh, had some contact with uh, people who say they've heard from your brother, uh, Kathy McDonough, uh, Caputo, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think I spoke to those people, but I think they were the source of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, have you? Did you? Did you tell this information to the grand jury? that you'd had contact with those people? I think I did. Well, I don't, I told them I'm, I was hearing it. And if, if it were attributed to someone, I think it might be such people as that. And you give them their names? Yes, I think so. Um, did you ever tell the FBI that these people, <laughs> that you had heard that these people might have had contact with your brother? No. Um, do you have any information as to whether uh, federal investigators have contacted any of these people? Oh, yes, there, there's, there's evidence of that. Okay, and how do you know that the, the, the FBI is contacted? Uh, because one of the, um, the young lady, uh, Kathy McDonough, um, have ended up with a perjury charge against her. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, Teresa, uh, I've seen her picture in the paper and testifying at court. So they're all contacted. Um, and finally, let me just ask you a little bit about um, whether you've, uh, whether you ever saw John Connolly in the com in the company of your brother. Never. I don't believe I ever saw that. I think I, that'll be. I just never saw that. Would that have surprised you to see that? It would have. Did you Did you ever see uh, your brother in the company of any other federal law enforcement officials? No, James, not at all. James Ring, John Morris? No. Uh, um, how about, uh, did you ever see uh, federal law enforcement officials going to Stephen Fleming's mother's house? No. Those dinners were apparently uh, not uh, more than, more, there was more than just one. And, right. Um, but you never saw anybody going in and out of that yeah, house? Well, I've, of course, I've seen many people going in and out. You know, but I mean, you know, any of the FBI agents with whom you no, might be familiar? No, never. I, I can recall her family coming because she would be inviting everybody. They came from uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and they would come, and she'd love to cook for them, and that would be a big event. Did, uh, did anybody, uh, let me go back to the, um, to the, uh, Billy Johnson incident report. Right. Did anybody tell you what was in that report? No, no one ever told me what was in that report. So you have no knowledge of what was in that report? Absolutely. No knowledge of it. Okay. I, I, I never knew his name until years later, only because the <coughs> press was writing about his, his problems. Was it your earlier testimony that people did uh, suggest to you that um, they had been threatened by your brother? I have a sense that uh, I'd hear it, not from a, the individual, but I'd hear uh, people say, you know, uh, your brother frightened someone to death or something. And if I heard it, I'd, if I saw him, sometimes I wouldn't see him for six, seven months at a time. But if I did, I'd, I'd 
Sam, please, I hope that's not true. That's all I could say is I hope it's not true. Yeah. Were these people involved in politics or were they just, or were they also other people? I'm not, well, um, they, I don't know. I don't, I don't know anyone who's uh, then a candidate or anything. Mm -hmm. um, did you, did, if, if uh, I'm not sure I understood you, but when, when you did see your brother and you'd heard about these threats, did you ask him to, to try to stop that? I would say I hope that that's not true. I wouldn't want to get, in, uh, there's no sense in getting into an argument. He would say, I think it's not true. Uh -huh. But rather than um, argue about it, I would express my consternation with that kind of behavior. So did he ever talk to you, not just about the threats, but about any, other, any of his other activity that was illegal? No, he didn't, no. I, yeah. Would the council yield to me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, yeah, the, gentleman from Indiana. These people who uh, you had heard through the grapevine were threatened. Do you know who any of them were? I, I, I suddenly remember one. The, what would the, how many were there that you know of? No, I, um, I wouldn't hear it from them, but as I uh, say, I understand, indirectly. But, yeah. if, if somebody said, you know, he... Someone was scared he to scared death by Whitey. Yeah. No, excuse me. If somebody said, I was, uh, your friend of mine was scared to death by Whitey, they obviously would tell you their names. So we'd like to know the names of the people that were threatened. Oh, but not necessarily. He'd say he's arguing with someone about you, me. Taking my part, he thinks. And it wouldn't necessarily be that. I do recall one, might be. You only recall, you only recall one. Well, I... I this, by the way, happened many years ago. We're back to 25 years or something. And it was uh, in 1970. And uh, uh, the, one of the people running against me, he, um, he said someone in his camp there called me and said, uh, boy, your brother's angry and he's um, sounding off about things. And uh, so I, I drove up the street and I found him and uh, I said, you know, I, I, this is madness. Don't, don't do that. You know. Well, who, who was this person? It was the, the candidate was a fellow named Patrick uh, Loftus. Pat Patrick Loftus. Yeah. Okay. Now, were there any others like that? No, that's the only one I. Um, pinned down like that. I had forgotten about it. That well, was I mean, it, thirty it was, years. It, it was a political uh, opponent. Right. And you had a very long and, according to what I've heard, a pretty distinguished career. Right. Uh, you obviously had other political opponents. Did Whitey threaten any of the others that you know of? No, you I never. You said that from time to time you would hear this. I would hear him uh, uh, arguing. I think he probably thought he was doing it for me. And uh, I would always, I think ultimately... I'm sure around that time I made it very clear to him that I did not want that. And so please don't do it. Any, you can't recall any other names of people that were threatened? No. I don't think there were big incidents. It was just that uh, it was his displeasure and uh, they were concerned about it. I know that night I went and found him and, he, and I think at that time he said, I assure you I will never be near any of this again. The political thing, I suppose that's what was intended. I had forgotten about that incident, but it's, it comes to not mind now, and it was in 1970. You don't, you don't recall any after that time? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I'm sure, you know, if he, he um, he'd be willing to argue, but um, I don't, none, of them come to, none of it comes to my mind at this moment. Well, one last question. Uh, when you were, when the majority leader of the Senate, who was the heir apparent to becoming the pro tem, mm -hmm. who was indicted and convicted, who you said was a friend of yours and, and is a friend of yours, uh, what, that that happened uh, just prior to you becoming president of uh, uh, the Senate, president pro tem, didn't it? No, I think can it happened. Me, can you give me the time it frame happened, on that? I, well, it was in the seventies that all of that occurred, but um, 
and then I became the president in the middle of 1978. Um, the president of the Senate at that time was the one who would decide who would be the majority leader, and he appointed me. Mm -hmm. So you were then in the line of succession, so right. to speak. Right. I went into the, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have no knowledge of anything that led up to that that indictment or that investigation. No, I have no. I have, and I'm absolutely certain that I never would ask anyone or even indicate in any way that I would want some harm to f befall someone to further my ambition. I mean, w it's a was gross, Conley involved uh, in that? I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. So Conley was not involved in that. I don't think he was. was. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. Well, I think we're. Close to the end here. Let me just ask, you had weapons found next door. There were a lot of activities going on next door to you. Right. Uh, did, were you aware of this? I, uh, sure. I was aware when they were discovered and picked up. I mean, where did you find it? I didn't it? know. I mean, whoever, when they put them there, didn't tell me, by the way, we... Oh, no, I understand. But what did you think afterwards? I mean, did you, you obviously, you concerned? Was, well, I don't know. They were hidden away, and I think that the time when um, they were discovered, uh, I didn't even realize that people had come and done it. That is to say, have come and taken them away. I just didn't know that. For all of those years that the Flemmy family lived there, it was um, two very, very uh, fine people, old people, and for a long, long time, the widow of, and the mother of uh, Stephen Fleming. They, um, the house had become vacant, and uh, they had been, um, they were looking for some place, and uh, they came there. Yeah, I mean, but, they, uh, these weren't big lots or anything, though, right? Pardon were, me? These were relatively small units and small oh, lots. Oh, yeah, very small. Very close to each other, right? Very, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Mee and Mr. Delahunt, I think we're close to you. So the Flemmy house was right next door to, uh, right. to your home. Mm -hmm. how, how much distance is there between the two? Um, perhaps from here to the desk, the first desk. And um, you, you're aware of the machine guns and the other uh, ammunition that was taken out of, I mm -hmm. guess, the back shed, after the fact, I mean. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you never had any um, knowledge of... Uh, None. Uh, not, not of guns, uh, guns being there, but no, nothing ever looked suspicious over there. No. Did, um, did you know, did you know Debbie Davis? I don't think I ever met uh, Debbie Davis, no. You're aware of it. it's alleged that she was murdered next door. Yes. Um, I realize the difficulty with this. I'm, I'm curious after all that has um, transpired. Um, do you want your brother to give himself up now? Do I want him to? I hope he does what is the right thing. Do you want law enforcement? Would you? Do you want law enforcement at this point to effectively um, find him and bring him back to uh, to face charges? Do I want them to? Well, let me let me phrase it differently. At I worry. I worry about the thing I told you in the first place, Congressman. I can't get away from that. My belief that the. Um, effort was made to kill him, and that it was uh, done by an FBI agent, Mr. Morris. And I'm mindful of the um, finding of the judge, Judge uh, Wolf. Wolf. He said, I believe, and he uses the verb uh, in order to murder Bulger, that the um, Morris went and met with um, O'Neill of the Globe, to have that printed. And when um, the question is asked each time, they say, well, what did you think about, I, I tell you, I, one thing I knew, it was this, that um, whether it were true or false, the fact is, uh, 
identifying him as such might result in his murder. And that was the judge's conclusion. And I think, and it was a chilling thing for me. With all of the talk about killings and the rest, believe me, I don't, I know it may seem um, as though I'm expressing all my sensitivity to this particular situation. Uh, it's only that it's under color of authority that it, that it really disturbs me, that people would violate their office by, by doing that. I think it's the same sense of indignation that I'm, well, I'm aware of because I'm here at the, your committee as you try to deal with the perennial question of who will police the police. And I, so I, I have no quarrel with uh, whatever you are thinking. I, in fact, I think I, if I were here, I'd be um, similarly um, outraged. And also, um, so, but, but with respect to the question, the original question, I don't know, I, I don't know exactly um, how to give the answer, just in view of my lack of, my lack of uh, confidence in these people. Okay, uh, let me ask you a question. Was that part of your rationale in 1995 when you got the phone call? Uh, not to uh, not to go immediately to law enforcement in an effort yeah. to try to. 1995. I still hadn't seen the official kind of um, uh, pronouncement by the judge, but I was always mindful of that uh, fact that some years before that had appeared, and the only people who would know it would, you know, with any kind of degree of certitude, would be the ones who were to be an FBI informant is surely to be known for being that by the FBI. So do you question the ability of law enforcement to, if in fact they were able to, um, to capture uh, mm -hmm. James Bulge, do you question whether or not they could uh, keep him from, from being murdered? But I don't know, I, I'm just, uh, I'm taken by the fact that I have to have the doubt. I do have, I have a doubt. Would my friend yield? Sure. Uh, Mr. Bulger, today, as we sit here in the year 2003, and there have been changes, obviously, in the Boston office of the FBI, as well as in the leadership of the FBI down here in Washington, mm -hmm. um, you expressed a concern. You made it in your opening statement that you, you believed Partially, it's my understanding on the finding by Judge Wolf. But did you have any other evidence as opposed to a feeling that there was a, uh, that some wanted your brother killed? Yeah, it was a strong feeling. I think but it was a feeling. Based on reason. Can In I, fact, uh, yeah. let me interrupt. Sure. Would you provide this committee with what you would discern as the motive for the FBI wanting to kill your brother? I can tell you. Tell us. It's the finding of uh, Judge Wolf, too, after large hearings. He said that um, uh, Morris had been um, involved in this unsavory kind of relationship, and therefore, and he had accepted um, something from my brother. He thought that my brother had outlived his usefulness, and he therefore knew that someday my brother would be brought in, and his own misconduct I, would have... I, I understand. Let me interrupt you by saying Mr. Morris is no longer, obviously, right. with the Bureau. Uh, do you have oh. that same concern today? Oh, do, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I know you said, asked, that was your question, I apologize for that. I think it's, um, I don't know, my con confidence is uh, shaken, but I don't, I don't know. I don't believe that most, you remind me just saying this, I, most of those people that we've d had the names about, Mr. Condon and, um, and old, the fellow who 
mm -hmm. Sheehan and those people, they seem to me to be men of integrity. I really don't, I cannot believe, I don't want, you don't have to listen to this, but that they would have knowingly um, been parties to um, this terrible uh, commitment of three men for their whole lifetimes. I just find that so, uh, I don't know uh, Rico. I don't know Rico, and I, um, so when someone, I don't, if it's somebody I don't know, like Morris, I suppose that's easier for me. But when I'm around with those, when I have been around with them, they were in state government, um, they seem, it, it would see be, it would be so base for them you to, to uh, have been a party to that, and then not to, and then to be, I don't know, so, in my view, upstanding. Let me just change the subject for one moment. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to the uh, issue of uh, Mr. Davis and, and Trooper Johnson. When you were, pre you were preparing the affidavit, um, I don't know whether it was Mr. Kiley of yourself that prepared the Dave Davis uh, affidavit, but I would suggest to you, Mr. Bulger, that was he inquired of as to whether he went to the state police office and sought the uh, and sought the uh, the report? May I, may I answer, Mr. Chairman? Um, uh, all of the affidavits um, were uh, my work product. All of them are a result of conduct, contact following our June third interview here. And I asked particular questions of all of them, drafted them, they edited them, every one of these individuals. So well, let me interrupt you, Tom. And, and, let, and let, no, let me interrupt you. And no, did, I did not ask You did not question. ask him that question. Because I would suggest the fact that Mr. Davis, who was the director of Massport, should go and seek the report can be described as, as unusual. Did you at any time inquire who happened to be the uh, chairman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee? In 81, it's Chester Atkins. It's Chester Atkins. Right. And it's my understanding that this outside amendment was inserted in the House as opposed to the Senate? Is it? We, we don't know, Mr. Congressman. There's, there's different accounts in the press. And do you know who would have been the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee at that time? If you can remember. I can't remember right now. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, that... That's in the public record and we can find that out. Yeah, I, I, I would hope that the, uh, um, that the committee... Uh, We're going to look at that. I would, think it's clear. ...would review and have staff uh, conduct its own, its own interviews. And let me conclude by saying uh, to you, Mr. Chairman, um, I sincerely hope that this... Uh, effort in terms of an examination of the FBI and then specifically the Boston office uh, continues. I think it's very important and I believe that it's time for us to, uh, to consider having Mr. Connolly in front of this committee, Mr. Morris in front of this committee, Mr. Weeks and Mr. Martirano. And I would hope that uh, under your direction uh, that the staff would be instructed to uh, initiate whatever has to be done in terms of interviewing them. And uh, well, let, let me just say, obviously, uh, this probably not our last hearing on this issue, but we coordinate with the Justice Department on this. Mr. Conley has a appeal pending, uh, but that is something that we're certainly looking at. I'm sure the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Should I assume that Mr. Delahunt used all my time? You can, if you have another question, no, I think we're ready to wrap this up. It's been a long day, that's I think, okay. for no, all of no, us. No further questions. Let me just ask, Mr. Bolger, is there anything you want to add at the end of this that uh, you, you'd like to say to straighten anything out, something you didn't get in the record? No, no, I, 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 I don't know. It's, it's over now, but uh, <laughs> I wanted you to know that I, I understand your purpose, and I'm serious about uh, respecting it. No, thank I you. I mean, it's the, it's the terrible questions, but it's the perennial question about right. who will watch the watches, yeah. and it's going to be, it's going to continue other people here. will be doing it 
many years hence. It's an ongoing well, duty. Well, yeah. unfortunately, it just I don't think it's confined to Massachusetts. We've had other mm -hmm. uh, issues that we'll continue to look at, but this has been very helpful. Obviously, we're going to come back and this has raised some other issues. As, as you sure. said, we want to go back and look, and, and but we appreciate your being here today. All the affidavits will be entered into the record. Thank, and, thank you. And all, how about also the, um, the statement that we alluded to and said we'd read in instead concerning the visit last week? Yes, that is, that will be, uh, Mr. Lotter, do you have some questions still remaining? One, if you could bear with sure. me. Sure. I know you want to move along. I, Mr. Bulger, earlier today I asked you uh, if you'd asked for a grant of immunity when you testified, and I, I think I said a state grand jury. And you, my understanding is you never went to a state grand jury, yeah. it was a federal grand jury, so I hope. I hope that my uh, uh, bad asking didn't get me the wrong answer. No, when sir. you appeared in front of the federal grand jury, did you seek a grant of immunity? Yes, I, yes, I did. And, and can you explain to us why that if, that, if that section of the law is correct, the sibling exception that you talked mm -hmm. about, why? Because it was a federal grand jury originally, and it was uh, a question in my mind as to how uh, much protection the Massachusetts statute afforded me. There were questions like that. Okay. Thank you. That, that's okay. all. I have. Thank you very thank much. You very, thank, thank you. Thank you very you much. much. Uh, the hearing will be adjourned. After the hearing, a couple of the committee members spoke briefly with reporters. I can understand how someone would not have a clear recollection of something. That so that's, I think it's, in a lot of those cases, it's a, it was a fair question. Congressman, do you, uh, do you believe that Mr. Bulger was credible today? Did he appear credible to you? I, I do appear, I, I mean, I, I do think that he, uh, he did his level best to answer the questions that the committee had. and. Uh, I think he was a credible witness in talking to my colleagues here. They felt that he, he, as I said, did his level best to answer the questions of the committee. Do you feel that he advanced the investigation in any way, and if so, how? Well, uh, he certainly eliminated a lot of questions that we had regarding some of the FBI agents who uh, we thought had uh, exercised certain uh, uh, influences on, on the investigation. So. We put markers down during this during this uh, session, and now I think uh, it it uh, gives us some direction on where to go with with the with the further investigations. With as as Mr. Delahunt was mentioning, either Mr. Matarano or Mr. Weeks or Mr. Conley, or indeed Mr. Davis or, or some others uh, that uh, the committee has some interest in. You believe him when he says he doesn't know where his brother is or hasn't uh, talked to him recently? I, I do believe him. Yeah. Thank you. actually subpoenaed him before and just testified. Why would he embarrass himself uh, by taking the fifth? And for any public official to say, you know, uh, this is a tool for innocent people. Uh, it is a tool for people not to incriminate themselves. It's a tool that someone uses when they think what they might say 
uh, was against the law. You're referring to the, I don't believe, uh, uh, I don't recollect, that's what you're referring to as a tool. I'm saying to you that uh, everyone in the United States of America has the right to use their Fifth Amendment privilege, but they don't have a right to describe it, in my judgment, uh, as a tool for someone who has nothing to hide. Thank you, Congressman. Thank, Thank you. you. What's ahead on C-SPAN 2? Next, a hearing on fraud at the Union Labor Life Insurance Company, which is owned by the AFL-CIO. That's followed by remarks from Nebraska Senator Chuck Hagel on U.S. foreign policy. Now we'll look at some of our political programming this weekend. On Saturday, Democratic presidential candidate Massachusetts Senator John Kerry will speak at a forum in Mason City, Iowa. It's part of a series of events in the state with presidential candidates hosted by Iowa Senator Tom Harkin. Love Live coverage Saturday starting at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. And on Sunday in Chicago, the Rainbow Push Coalition hosts a forum with seven of the...